Hello Church, welcome to this week's sermon. My name is Henry Loke. This is God's Feeding Station. It's an honor to be with you today. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you've all had a good week. hope everybody's safe and healthy. And uh, I want to thank you for, for joining us today. Before we get started, I just want to remind everybody, uh, that, you know, we have the website, we have the app. I want everybody to share these things with your friends and your family. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes and on YouTube and on Facebook, you know, so you can share all these things with your friends and family, get the word of God out there. Today we are in Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We've been walking through the Beatitudes here line by line these past few weeks. And just like in weeks past, there is a lot to look at in this one Beatitude today. And it's a really, a really, um, it's one that asks a lot of questions of us. It, It demands close examination. Are we pure in heart and we'll talk about what that means how that looks and uh we're going to go back to the ancient language as we have been wanting to do these past few weeks the word for pure in the greek is kataros hope i'm saying that right and it's got a bunch of different meanings it means clean as laundry is clean as washed clean uh it means uh like corn that has been taken off the off the ear and winnowed. Uh, for those of you who don't know what winnowing is, it's you would take um, grains and you would put them in this kind of big bowl and kind of shake it and the, um, the chaff, kind of the dust and all the things that were not of the grain would, it was lighter than the grain, it would, you know, kind of get tossed up in the air and, and get blown off. Uh, it's that type of definition. Um, it can be used for an army that has been purged of those that are cowardly, those who don't want to fight, those are who are discontent, uh, those who are cowardly, uh, and all that remains is this fit. I think of the Roman Empire, this army that was just fit, ready to go, ready to take on all comers. And it often appeared with another Greek word, uh, akir, Akiratos, I'm gonna, I'm butchering that, I'm sure. A k e a k e r a t o s, and what that word meant, it was milk or wine that was not diluted by water, or that was not filled with impurities, or metal that had no alloy in it. So it was like pure gold, pure bronze, pure silver. So nothing that had any impurities in it. So when you look at those definitions of the Greek. What we're looking at here is a heart that isn't, nor can it be mixed with anything else. It has to only contain the things of God. Its only intention is toward the things of God. And so what gets in the way? What are the things that can, I guess, soil the heart? And one of the big things, at least for me, is motives. What are my motives For doing things. And so, in pure Doug White fashion, and for those who don't know Pastor Doug or never heard him preach, Doug always used to ask a lot of questions of himself in his sermons and, you know, by extension of the audience. And so, I've got a lot of questions here when it comes to motives today. One is when we give generously, do we do so expecting no notice, no return? Or do we do it to give ourselves some self-satisfaction? That will, knowing that maybe we'll receive some thanks, we'll look good, you know, people will admire us for how generous we've been. You know, do we give out of the do we give out of our abundance or do we give out of our poverty? As the story of the woman who gave the two mites. Uh, that Jesus told in Mark 12. What do we give out of? If we do something that demands that we sacrifice something, we do it out of sacrifice, do we do it with the knowledge that, hey, you know, people see this, I'll look like a martyr. You know, I'll, I'll people will look at me and go, wow, you know, what a great guy, what a great gal, you know, he or she is. Look at what they've given. Or do we do it knowing that what God sees in private He'll reward. 
And is that enough? I always struggle with, and again, I relate this story not to say, oh, look how humble Henry is, right? Because again, it's about motive. But I use this as an example. You know, in preaching or when I used to lead worship at New Day, you know, people, if they enjoyed the worship, they thought it was spirit-led, whatever, they would come up and tell me and say, hey, great job, you know, whatever. And it always made me feel a little uneasy because it's though preaching that you know this is not about me it's about god doing worship was about leading people hopefully around the throne of god and in worship and praise of god and so i was always uncomfortable with that and i i think i think it was a holy spirit thing to go hey you know don't get a big head here because i always i always used to relate this story when i used to play drums for worship the big difference between playing at a club for an audience and playing at a church for worship because at a club you know you're trying to draw attention you're you're being the showman right you're putting on a show and you know it's it kind of fills that ego you know and and in worship it's not about me it's not about the band it's about pointing everything to god and so there's quite a shift that has to take place and I had to learn a lot when i first uh, started playing worship uh, and playing drums on a worship team because it really, you really have to change the way you think. And there's a story I read in, in studying this week, John Bunyan had given a sermon and a gentleman had walked up to him and said, hey, you know, great sermon today. And John Bunyan's reply was, yeah, the devil already told me that as I was coming down the pulpit steps. This really makes you think, why are we doing what we're doing? And for whose glory are we doing it? Do we engage in our work for God, for others? Uh, do we do it for pay or merely because we're called to serve? Jesus came to serve and not be served. Do we do it in the same manner that Jesus did it or are we expecting something back? Or we, are we selfless? Or are, are we on self-display? Are we calling attention to ourselves? Do we work for Christ or our own reputations? Is attending church for the desire to get closer to God and build on that relationship? Or is it strictly out of habit and out of ritual? Just something I do every Sunday, something I'm supposed to do. Do we pray and get into the word? Because we have a sheer desire to get to know God and to know his word better. Spend time with him. Build our relationship with him. Or is that something we do because that's what, quote unquote, good Christians do? Is our faith born out of our understanding that we need God? that whole understanding of sin and what it does to our relationship and do we have a desire to mend that relationship and so hence have a desire and an understanding of our need for God or does it just make us comfortable in our own skins to say, hey, you know, I'm a Christian and, you know, I, I, I seek God and I look for God and if I have a, a kind of surface relationship, I'm good with that. Here's a big, because here's the thing, this is the big one. It's really hard to ask questions like that of ourselves and stand in front of the mirror and look ourselves in the eye and really do a self-analysis. It's hard to do that because it can bring guilt. It can, it can bring shame. It requires us to shed everything, all the, the, the pre-fabricated you know, fronts that we put up. It requires us to get rid of that and really take a good, hard look at where our hearts are for God. But it's really uncomfortable to do that. It's not fun because no one knows <laughs> our vices and our sins and, and all these, and our, our addictions, whatever those are, no one knows them on this earth anyway better than we do. But it has to be done because faith begins in our hearts. Jeremiah 4.14 says, O Jerusalem, wash your heart from evil that you may be saved. How long shall your wicked thoughts lodge within you? 
In Psalm 24, 4 and 5 says, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. The heart has to be pure. It has to be uh, unmuddied and unmixed. There cannot be anything that we're putting in there willfully thinking that we can mix it with our desire to see and seek God and the things of God, right? Lewd thoughts, uh, lust of the flesh, covetous, things like covetousness and, and envy. They've got to be flushed out because these are the things that get in the way here of our you know, it's like a it's like a cell phone call, right? Can you hear me now? <laughs> when we get static, we drive out of service, we keep losing connection, right? That's what these things do. They create static on the line, or they they force a drop. You know, they force a drop call. They force a drop in 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 the cell phone service, and we have to get rid of those things. We have to get back into a good area where we're in 4G download of the things of God. Because remember, Jesus said, it's not what goes into the body, it's what comes out of the heart that defiles a man. So it's what comes out of the heart or the things that we put in it, in this case, that get in the way of our connection with God. So all those things of the world that are driving us crazy, we gotta get rid of those. And we gotta focus on the things of God. They have to be, our hearts have to be purified by faith and they have to be entirely for God, entirely. God wants it all, all means all. Now, the good news is, because we all struggle with this, don't we? We all, you know, thoughts come in and we get angry and all these things. The great thing about this is God is the one who does this in his grace and his mercy. It's a work of God. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. We take our thoughts captive to Christ Give them up. God does the rest of the work. Because remember, remember David in Psalm 51, right? We This is one of the first, uh, I'm looking at my whiteboard, uh, it's so far back, I don't, it's not even up there. Um, this was one of the first sermon series we started doing this year, was on Psalm 51. David's sin with Bathsheba. David had a very clear view and understanding of himself and of his heart. And in Psalm 51, 10, he says, create in me. So God, you have to do this. I can't do it. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Right, Just as it wasn't in David's power to create a clean heart in himself, it's not in our power. We have to ask God to do it. Because the only one who can do it is the one who created the heart in the first place. Right? We do not have the power to create a new heart within us. Only the creator, the one who created the original, can recreate our heart the way it needs to be created in him. Do we have a willing spirit? That's the question. But we also get that from God. God, again, he says, renew a right spirit in me. God, you do it. You do the heart thing. You do the spirit thing. So this isn't a work of ourselves. It's something we turn to God for. And we got to do this. If we want to see God, and I mean really see God, clearly, Jesus is very clear to say, if we want to see God, we've got to have a pure heart. Because we un understand, we only see what we're able to see. If we, if we only choose to see evil, if that's what we're geared on, that's what we'll see. If, we're only, if we only choose to see the flaws in the characters of those around us, that's what we'll see. If, we, if we're only able to look at the stars as these pinpricks of light in the sky, we're going to miss the big picture because they're all named. The planets and the stars, they're all named. And, and God has used them. And I, w I have to find... I have to find this explanation of the stars because I had my, the, the person I started my faith walk with, 
uh, Edith Hopkins, who has since passed on, has gone home to heaven to be with God. She explained how the stars, not from a horoscope perspective, because I think it's been hijacked, obviously, but how the stars and their constellations explained Christ's coming and told the story of the Messiah coming. I have to find that. Uh, it's been a long time since I've listened because I have a bunch of her stuff and her teachings on on cassette tapes. <laughs> it shows you how old I am. Um, but those teachings, right? So we miss those things. We miss the intention that God had for his creation if all we see are these little lights in the sky. You know, if, we, um, if we're walking you know, down the road and we see wildflowers and stuff, they just look like weeds to us. Right, we look. They look like a, just a, a nuisance in our garden, right? We miss the beauty of it, or we miss the uses of some of these plants that God designed them for. I mean, some of these plants can use for healing, uh, obviously for food. I mean, you look at how you know bees go to the wildflowers and then go, you know, and and go back to their hive, and how bees help the uh, the food chain. You miss all that. If you're not able to see it, if you don't recognize it, or if you choose not to see it. Now, there are minds that can only see opportunities for rude and crude jokes. Every opportunity is just a, or every situation is an opportunity to, you know, make a wisecrack or say something rude and, and think it's funny. It's only in God's presence that our souls are satisfied, I believe. I mean, we all long we all long for peace. We all long for that peace that passes all understanding. We all long for direction. And we long for just satisfaction in general, just to be, I've used this word before, just to be sated completely. I think that's only in God's presence. The world doesn't provide it. I mean, in the world, we're constantly chasing our tail looking for the next thing. It's, I think it's only coming face to face with God and being in his presence that that complete and utter peace and satisfaction can be experienced. Psalm 17, 15 says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. See, seeing God and being satisfied in that is our duty and our comfort. Jesus is saying very clearly, this is our duty. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who seek it, who desire it, who chase after it, who work at it. Those who do that will see God. So it's our duty and our comfort in seeing him and being satisfied with that. See, God and his ways must always be set before us. Those are the things we are focused on. Our minds must must be fixed on him and the experience of him then should be and will be more satisfying than anything the world can give us. Again, I've said this very often lately. Everything the world is crying out for, justice, peace, equality, Love, understanding, who's got it? God already has it. He's the perfect example of all those things. Why don't we seek him out? Why don't we seek him out? He's the one that has it all. He's got it all. What is it going to take for us to share that with people and to pursue it? If we want those things I just mentioned, God, he's the one that has them. I don't have them, right? All the laws and rules and policies that you can put in place, that's not going to bring peace and satisfaction because there's always going to be somebody who doesn't agree and is going to have hate in their heart. They're going to choose to see color. They're going to choose to see race. They're going to choose to see uh, male or female and base judgments on that. They're always going to choose to do that. It's only when we get a pure heart and start to see things as God sees things and sees people as God sees people that, you know, this gets changed. 
This is the thing that gets in the way. The mind is the thing that causes the problems. The heart, right? The heart is the one where that innate knowledge of God and that desire to do good resides. It's in here, right? If this doesn't love as God loves, this will justify it, right? We have to make the decision for the things of God to allow God in and then to work on our hearts. Because as this goes, this will follow. I truly believe that. You know, when our hearts are touched, I mean, I mean, I think about it. Um, when our hearts are that, that uh, our hearts are full of love with somebody, this has no choice but to follow. At least for me. And so, yeah, this can get in the way of that. And, you know, this can cause conflict. My head can cause conflict with my heart. But there's something in my heart that knows. And you call it conscience, call it whatever you want. It's God that's in there who's pulling on my heart saying, this is the way you should go. Will you follow? It's up to me. comes back to choice again, doesn't it? All these things that we've been talking about with the Beatitudes... We have choices to make. We have choices whether we want to follow these things, whether we want to seek all these things that Jesus is saying we need to seek after if we want to achieve the end result. If we want mercy, we have to be merciful. If we want to be comforted, we must mourn. Come to an understanding of our sin, why we need God. Mourn over our sin and the need for Jesus to go to the cross come to that understanding if we want to be comforted will we do so because here's the other question too if if we can't even deal with ourselves if we can't look ourselves in the mirror because of our iniquities and our sin and our guilt and our shame if we can't come to terms with that how then are we going to come face to face with God? And I know God does not pour the guilt and all that on us. So in essence, it should be easy to enter into the presence of God in the midst of all our garbage that we have on us. But how many times, think about it, how many times does my my version of myself, right? What I've done, what I think about what I've done, the guilt I feel, how many times does that get in the way of entering into the presence of God? It shouldn't because God is, you know, it's the story of the prodigal. He's waiting with open arms, but it does, doesn't it? That self-examination helps us to understand who we are honestly and to know then Yeah, I want to change. Yes, I hate feeling like this. Who can help me change? God. God is the one that can work all this in my heart. Where now I want to seek his things. Yeah, there may be some counseling depending on how serious the situation is and and those types of things. Yeah, there are always things that God will use from a worldly perspective to help us get to that point. But God is the one Uh, eventually that does the work. Ultimately, he's the one that does the work in our heart. He will use other things to get us to open up and create a willing spirit and God will do the work. But if we can't get to an honest self-assessment of ourselves, I, I don't know that that's possible. It's that thing of, you know, how do you get help for your problem? What's the first thing you have to do? You have to admit you have a problem, right? If we don't admit we need God, Will we ever seek him out? Will we want to be in his presence? If we can't stand to be in in our own skin, how are we going to walk into the Holy of Holies where the holiest of all, the purest of all, the best of all waits to meet us eye to eye? I think it gets in the way. I, I don't know that it should, but I think it does. And everybody's different. Everybody deals with it on a different level. So can we 
can we be honest with ourselves and say, yes, I need God? Right, because in, in the end, do we desire the chaos of the world or the peace of God? Which one do we want? Because the longer we, I think, the longer we sit here, the more chaos we experience. Don't we see that now? I want the peace of God. I need to be about the work of his kingdom. Be about, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be given to you. Right, because the bottom line is, this is what we're created for. We are created for the joy and the presence of God. We are created to be in relationship with him. Our hearts desire his peace. We all feel that. It's his peace we desire because we all know that the, the world doesn't bring peace. It brings chaos. I mean, think about it. Think about those times where you've been in perfect step with him and when we're marching to our own drummer. We know the difference. We, we know the difference, don't we? So, which will we choose? Because again, it comes down to our choice. If we're not seeing God, we got to ask, what's the condition of my heart? Right? What are my thoughts? What are my desires? Am I taking every thought captive to Christ? Am I, allow, uh, am I allowing God to work in my life, to change my heart, or am I engaged in a battle where I don't want to give up the things I know I need to give up. And that could be something as simple as guilt for past sins that have already been dealt with as God's removed them as far as the east is for the west, from the West. Forgiven and forgotten. But we hang on to some of these things, don't we? So will, will I give up the things I know I need to give up or am I going to hang on to them for some reason and allow them to continually get in the way of my coming in really truly coming into God's presence and seeing him in his pureness and his holiness and his righteousness. Because again, the awesome thing about this is that, you know, we talked about how God will use counselors and, and, those, and those types of things to help us. This is a God thing. This is a God work. This is a God movement in our lives. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that enables us to let go of the worldly things and allow God to do what he's got to do in our hearts. If we let him, we can hold on and we can, you know, we can roll up like a turtle in a shell and not let God in. Or we can open up and say, God, I want your grace and I want your mercy. I know you've shown it by sending your son. So do what you got to do and trust in that. Trust in the knowledge that he has nothing but good intentions toward us. Everything he brings into our lives is for our betterment. Maybe hard. I'm not saying it's all easy. Man, I know it's not all easy. And the things I've experienced, while not easy, are nothing compared to what other people have gone through. But when God is working and chastening and, you know, iron sharpens iron and, 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 and you know, putting us in the fire so that the dross rises to the top so he can skim that off and make us pure, right? It's because he loves us, because he wants us to see him. He wants to be in that, you know, solid relationship, perfect relationship with us. Will we allow him to do that? Because if we do that, if we allow him to work in us, then we can say, oh, the bliss of the man whose heart and motives are absolutely pure. For that man, that woman, will be able to see God. Is that what you want? Is that what I want? If the answer is yes, let's decide for that and allow God to do his work. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for your word and for a deeper understanding of what it means to have a pure heart and why we should have a pure heart. Because we do want peace and we do want um, satisfaction in seeing you and being in your presence because we know, you know, we've experienced it enough to know that being in your presence is way better than not being in your presence than being in the world. And so we want to be in your presence and we, and, and we know that's what we're designed for and we, that we're made for that relationship. So Father, help us to get out of our own way. Help us to have the strength and the courage to self-assess and to look out at ourselves honestly, at our hearts honestly, 
and, and to see what needs to go. What needs to be jettisoned? What needs to be burned off in the fire? What is that dross that needs to be skimmed off so that our hearts would be made pure? Father, help us to have the courage to do that. Help us to have the faith and the courage then to come to you and say, God, this is where things are. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. It takes faith and it takes trust. But we know that you have nothing but the best intentions toward us. Help us build up our strength and our faith to know and trust in that. To know that we can trust you. To know that that we can lean into you and, and you won't drop us. You won't ignore us. You won't discard us because you love us. And we've been, we've been forgiven. Those sins that we're dealing with and the things that we carry around have been dealt with on the cross. We can shed ourselves of the fear of retaliation for those things. Know it because you don't do that. You may chasten us and you may have to, you know, slap our hands a little bit because there are always consequences for sin and those situations need to be fixed and the relationship repaired, but help us to repent with faith and trust and courage and confidence because of who you are. And we lift all this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said at the beginning, I uh, hope you all, you know, in, in, again, thank you all for being here again this week. Uh, I encourage you all to share it, www.godsfeedingstation.org. That's the website. A lot, uh, we have a lot to offer there, so check it out if you haven't already. Uh, we have a Facebook page, a YouTube page, and uh, we're working on the Instagram thing. I haven't quite figured out how to do that yet, but we're getting there. But if you'd like to partner with the Feeding Station, you can do that on the app. Uh, there's a little giving thing, uh, at least on the on the Android uh, devices, it's on the bottom, I think on the Apple devices, it's on top. But you can partner with us that way, you can do it. Uh, there's a little donation thing uh, at the website. And so uh, appreciate uh, your help in all those things. And um, if you'd like to contact me, you can get a hold of me at gfsministry316 at gmail.com. And I would love to hear from you and love to hear your comments and concerns, prayer needs. You can, do, uh, you can let us know what your prayer requests are on the app or you can email me at that email address and we'll be praying for you and, and even get your prayer up on the daily prayer broadcast. We've done that. We had uh, a close friend of the feeding station. Uh, they had a family medical thing going on and uh, we, uh, we prayed for him and got it up on the prayer broadcast and, and the prayer warriors around the world prayed and everything went fine and, and things are going well as far as I know. So last I heard, so... Prayer does work, and so we'd be happy to get your prayer requests up on the feeding station as well. So with that being said, again, thank you for being here. I love you all. Stay safe. Stay healthy this week. And Lord willing, we'll talk again next week. Take care. Bye-bye.